So I'm really excited about today's guest. He is a close friend, a close brother, and a man that I deeply respect. We have a former U.S. Air Force Captain, Brian with the Y Reeves. He's also an internationally renowned author, life and relationship coach. He is the host of the podcast, Men This Way, and his viral blog has been read by over 30 million people. And so highly recommend him. This is a really good podcast. We jump into so many different topics about understanding relationship, which a lot of people listening, you're either single wanting to be in relationship or you're in a relationship. We're going to pop the hood and look underneath the hood to understand some of the challenges that come up and what may just be differences in men versus women or masculine versus feminine. So really good episode. Looking forward to having you join us. And for everybody listening, stay battle tested. Welcome to the Winner Folsom podcast, uh, your source for battle tested leadership and resiliency. And we have a great episode and a great guest, don't we, Josh? I'm really excited about today's guest. We have Brian with a Y Reeves joining us today. And not only was he an Air Force captain, so he's part of our warrior culture, but he also works with men. He does a lot of work on relationship and he's got a podcast. It's called Men This Way. He also has a viral blog that's been read by 30 million people. So he's been in the space for a long time and helps a lot of people. He's helped me a lot and he's one of my closest friends. So really glad to have Brian join us today. So welcome, Brian. Thanks, mm-hmm. fellas. I am delighted to be here. I see how you stacked the whole Air Force thing, Josh. I see how you did this. <laughs> hey, you know, I got to stack right. it when I got uh, it. When I got all it, right, I bro. It. Whatever, man. All right. Oh, come on now. We can't go down that rabbit hole. Oh, yeah, we can. It's the only way that us, us men can love, send, share respect and love. <clears throat> I understand. I understand. <laughs> <clears throat> well, look, let me tell you, I got plenty of paper cuts in my time as a flying the LWD 90 that I flew in the Air Force. Hmm. LWD-90, the large know. wooden desk with nine drawers. <laughs> Dangerous mission I was on every day of my- You were legit Chair Force. I was legit. Dude, uh, out past the proud. wire, baby. Served proud. Nice. Yeah. Hmm. Hey, I'm excited. I think this is a really good conversation to, to jump into, and maybe we'll just kick it off around relationship because- I'm guessing a lot of people that are listening are in relationship either currently or previously that they can take a look at. And one thing that comes to mind that's really important, and we can go wherever this goes, but Brian, you've been really good at needs. I think you model Mm -hmm. to me, at least you're really actively curious Mm -hmm. about your partner's needs. You guys are both in the relationship space, very active Mm -hmm. around boundaries, needs work. But the one thing I'll kick it off with is what I've actually shared this multiple times is you've really modeled to me the difference from going from codependence to Mm -hmm. independence to interdependence and being able to go, I got me, you got you. Here's my needs. What are your needs? Let's learn it. And I'm still going to live my life and fill my bucket up. And sometimes I'm missing my partner if we don't share a common need, but I'm happy for them Mm because they're meeting their need. And that's just been so powerful to model. So maybe we just kick it off there. Like, anywhere you want to start around that. Cause I think a lot of people struggle in the codependency, like mm-hmm. I need this and then you need to give it back to me and we get stuck there. So maybe could you talk a little bit around that? You know, the first thing that immediately leaps out at me is when I got out of the air force at 26, I just spent 10 years, five years ROTC, five years active duty. I was taught to serve, but to not have needs. I don't get to have needs. What mm-hmm. I get to do is serve serve Mm -hmm. those others, particularly my superiors, whatever the authority is to serve their needs, right? And any needs that I might have, they're not even my needs. They're the needs of the government or the military or the mission. Mm. And so, you know, when I got out of the military at 26, I was incredibly, I had capable of meeting the needs of whatever mission I was on of subverting my human needs, my emotional needs, my own body's needs to whatever the needs of, again, whatever the mission I thought I was on task for. That made me actually incredibly challenging to be in partnership with by every Mm. woman I tried to be in partnership with after that. Mm. Not only did I not know what my needs were, I didn't even think I was allowed to have needs. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. You feel that, Philip? You feel yeah, that? Dude, I got you. Bro. <laughs> You're throwing some this, some left hooks in. Uh, but, yeah, listening. dude. Uh, last couple of years, man, this has been a big one. Keep going, man. 
Yeah. So, you know, so, and I tried to do intimate relationship with women from that place for the next 10 years. And of course, man, there's the, the schizophrenic experience that I then went through because of course I have fucking needs and I'm hurting in so many ways, but I'm not allowed to talk to those again in my own head. And of course I chose women that would mirror my own schizophrenia, women who, Mm -hmm. you know, wanted to nurture me and love me. But the moment I might've expressed some discomfort or some you know, way of wanting something different, they would fucking want to kill me for kind of expressing that. Not that I expressed it skillfully. I was always unskillful too in the ways that I would communicate. I mean, it was just a shit show for 10 good solid years after the military. I mean, a veritable shit show. And I think a lot of it was around being disconnected from myself, from my needs, from, oh, I mean, you know, having healthy boundaries, all of that. Talk about, you know, I think the military beautifully teaches us how to be resilient in the face of a mission that is challenging, right? How to, you know, mind over matter, how to use our our mind to focus the body in a direction and focus all the resources and tools we have to get shit done. That generally does not serve well in intimate relationship, I've found. Mm. It has its place. Hey, would would you um, like say uh, the mission oriented man, which most of the men watching here, I think you probably self-identify as that. Is that synonymous with the nice guy? Not necessarily. The mission-oriented man can be a total dickhead. He can be a complete ass, can be a complete, you know, in service of the mission. And anyone mm-hmm. who gets in the way of that mission, I'm going to destroy. I don't think it's synonymous. He could be, could be a nice guy. I mean, the- I guess they're both people who subvert their needs. The nice guy that Dr. Glover talks about, no more Mr. Nice Guy, Mm -hmm. that's somebody who is not willing to actually share their authentic needs. And the service-based man, and I would be one of these, is Mm -hmm. also not allowed to do that. So I I just was catching a lot of similarities between those two common themes in relationship men's work. The only thing I would say is I see the shadow on both sides. So I feel like the service-based man could either suppress his needs and, and again, nervous system moves into freezing his own needs and appeasing his partners. Or the flip side is to feel like his needs aren't met and he attacks his partner because he's like, you're not fucking meeting my needs. And so they're both shadows of the service base, mm-hmm. man or woman. It's just a different lens of our nervous system. If you're fight or flight, you're going to look to attack your partner, make them the villain. If you're freeze and appease, you're going to shut down and try to appease your partner's needs. And so I think they're both different ways we deal with not actually expressing skillfully our needs and then allowing our partner to have needs too, which can be challenging. And let's talk about what is the core mission that when we step into relationship, the core mission, I believe all of us are ultimately up to whether we're, we go nice guy route or divide and conquer route, whatever the core desire, the core need in a way we could say is to feel safe, to have peace, you know, to be in a harmonious relationship with our partner. In a sense, that's what we go into intimate relationship for, is for safety, for security, to have a stable base. And what happens for us though, is because when we don't realize, like the nice guy, the freeze and appease guy, he's trying to meet the need of a secure, stable, safe relationship by just shutting up, shutting down. Because if I speak up, oh man, that's just gonna create chaos. So he shuts down, but what's the end result of that is, you know, either chaos or just long-term stagnation that leads to breakdown ultimately. Or resentment. Resentment, of course, exactly. Yeah. On the other side, you have the man who then is like, nah, fuck this. I'm not having drama in my relationship. We are going to have harmony. He tries to impose harmony by whatever that may look like for him. Maybe it looks like not allowing his partner to have emotions, to be upset, to cry, to have complaints about things or, you know, or she, whether it's about him or something else, that man will impose, try to impose harmony on any situation which just then breeds resentment and more rebellion or shutdown in his partner. Mm -hmm. And again, the result is again, it's ironic. It's the exact opposite thing we're trying to achieve. We thus create through those two shadows, those two polar opposites. You say that I've been an example, maybe or a model of kind of dancing this, this line of navigating needs and boundaries and being attuned to my partner's needs. And let me tell you, man, it is not easy work. And I've been with my wife now for seven years. And she is no pushover. I am no pushover. We could be what you would call a high conflict couple because we both just have a lot of fire. But it's through the mutual work of both of us making space for each other to have needs 
and helping each other even figure out what those are. Hmm. You know, for example, if I get upset about something or she gets upset about something rather than doing what I call meeting at the level of the complaint, you know, where most of us go is we meet at the level of the complaint. You know, let's just say she gets pissed off because I forgot to bring something. I forgot to bring the milk home, right? Whatever, you know, now she's upset and angry. Well, I'm pissed off that she's upset and angry about the milk. She's pissed off about the milk and I'm pissed off that she's pissed off about the milk. Right now we're arguing over the milk, but what's really going on underneath that is she has a need, let's just say, to feel heard, to feel like her requests are listened to. Right. Whereas he feels he may be reacting to the need of of feeling appreciated. He may have done all kinds of stuff that day that was really hard for him and really had a lot of challenges to work through. He carried a heavy fucking day. I mean, first responders, God only knows what a man or woman can go through in a day. And then he gets beat up for getting to bring the milk home at the end of the day. You know, what unmet need is going on beneath that complaint? When two people can start having that conversation, it's game changing Mm -hmm. for the relationship. How does somebody start to navigate that? Like you said, a lot of times people are going, where do I even start to figure out needs? And I know Philip and I've talked a lot about this too, of like us rediscovering what are our needs. And then I think some of the uncomfortability you go through of expressing that can feel humiliating. It can feel really vulnerable and uncomfortable to say, here's my need, especially if it's, I think Mm -hmm. as men, we deeply want, I know for me, appreciation to feel seen, to be acknowledged, to be desired is a lot like very common amongst men. It was like, why do I have to express yeah. this? Or it could feel so just curious, is there easy yeah. ways to think about this or to navigate this or the man listening going, I haven't even thought about this, but maybe that's true yeah. just to see your perspective on that. Well, the first thing I want to point out is just has what you've been doing so far been working for you? Arguing over the milk or arguing over, don't fucking be angry at me because I didn't bring home the milk. Is that working for you? Is that creating connection for the two of you? Is that helping you bridge conversations and get to a place of deeper understanding? My guess would be that it ain't. So the first step is just acknowledge that it ain't fucking working. Let's take a step back for a moment. And even just being willing to ask that question, what is going on beneath this? I'm a big fan of working with a third party to navigate these challenges where the therapist or coach or counselor or somebody who doesn't have an agenda for you who doesn't have a stake in what happens, but someone who can help you just see the deeper dynamic that's going on. Just even that, taking an argument to someone who is a a neutral arbiter of what's going on, who's for both of you, not for one of you, but for both of you, and just saying, you know what, we keep having this argument about the milk or about whatever. Help us see what's really going on underneath. What are the maybe, I heard this podcast and heard this guy say that there are probably needs deeper than what we're arguing about. Can you help us see what those needs might be? Pop the hood. Pop the hood. Great. Exactly. Let's pop the hood and look what's really going on in the machinery in here. That would just asking that question. Again, it's the beginning of getting beneath the level of the complaint. We just get so tripped up over the details of the complaint that we don't get to the deeper needs underneath. And we just, it's a shit show for, you know, indefinitely or just stagnancy because we're not really having the conversations we need to be having. I have a conversation that I have to have with my wife here based on <laughs> just what I just from right now. I'm like, I'm taking some notes. I'm like, great, great. Yeah. <laughs> Keep going, yeah. Brian. Keep going. Yeah, yeah. You're talking about understanding needs. I think what I keep hearing is the underlying theme is connection. And I also think what I'm also hearing is authentic connection, which can be very scary because I think is how I'm relating to this is as children, we didn't get our needs met a lot of the time. And so unconsciously I've tracked the pattern that we recreate similar dynamics to try to recreate child and have a different outcome. I've tracked it myself unconsciously. I would get patterns where I'm in conflict and I hated conflict in childhood, but I'm back in conflict and feeling the same way. So I found for me, I was a freeze appeaser learning to actually stop freezing, learn to lick inside. And for me, tones are really big deal. So I would attract the fighter flighter Mm. and I wouldn't let them know. And so I wouldn't be telling them like, Hey, lower your tone. I can't communicate right now because I'm feeling attacked and I'm on the defensive and I'm shutting down to try to get peace. I've had to learn to be like, Hey, my need is stop, lower your tone. Mm -hmm. Low your tone. I'm not leaving and I'll finish the conversation, which was yeah. scary to me. But in doing so, it resolves the nervous system because my partners never had feedback to learn what was happening. They didn't know their tone was here. They were having a very real experience that I was attacking them or yeah. I was doing X, Y, Z. So at least that's what's been really helpful for me is learning how to do the opposite. Um, and I think that's what you're saying is 
it seems scary, but you actually get connection because you're communicating authentically and that communication starts to bring into alignment uh, more connection or now I know the target. If you don't know the target, you're just pumping all over the place, repeating the pattern over and over again, right? And I think that's key is noticing the pattern. What have I been doing that isn't working? Or even if you don't necessarily parse out what are the things I'm doing that aren't working, just to recognize that whatever I'm doing, it ain't working. Hmm. Okay, so be willing. I'm a big fan of experimenting. Experimentation when it comes to relationship dynamics. So I have this coaching program for men called Elevate Your Relationship, just for men where we work on men's 100% responsibility for the relationship. Hey, you know, the other partner has their 100% responsibility too, but we focus on the men's 100%. And one of the things that we teach in this is what we call courageous vulnerability. Not just vulnerability, but courageous vulnerability. And there's essentially three key aspects of courageous vulnerability. And one is be willing to reveal what is hidden. Be willing to reveal what is hidden. Two is be willing to let go of control. And, and we'll take your example, Josh, what you just said about like tone of voice, for example. Third is be willing to be hurt. That's a big one there. Be willing to be hurt. So take, for example, the tone of voice thing, because I can relate to that, man. I've dated women that, you know, hell, even my own wife, she's Armenian, but she acts more like an Italian. Her family communication style is very exaggerated and immediately elevated and that doesn't hit my nervous system well i had a lot of rage in my home as a child and so you know i'm very attuned to tones of voice that feel threatening or scary to me but revealing what is hidden whoa when your tone of voice is like that i freeze up i literally get scared i know i'm this big juicy looking hunk of male beef <laughs> But I actually feel like my wife knows this, that as a child, I grew up with rage in my home, uncontrolled, terrorizing rage. And so every time it was a part of my primal wiring that is just way like attuned to the slightest bit of vocal agitation and immediately go, oh shit, danger. My wife knows that. So reveal what is hidden, right? That was hidden until I shared that with her. Let go of control, telling her, Babe, I need you. If I'm going to really be able to be present with you, this is what I need. Well, by offering that to her, I take the risk that she won't give that to me. I take the risk that she'll say, well, this is just how I communicate. You're going to have to deal with it or we can't be together. It's risky to speak to a need versus just a, hey, you know, it would be nice if you could, or just shutting down around it or trying to, you know, demand, punish her, control her, dominate her into not talking like that. That doesn't go well either, but a lot of men take one of those two routes, right? Freeze and appease or conquer and dominate. So the willing to let go of control, this is my need. I want to hear you, but I can't. When you speak in those tones, I'm instantly terrorized. I'm working with it, but you got to know that, and I'm seven years with my wife and still I feel that part of me that, you know, when she just sort of reacts to something and I don't understand what's going on immediately, I mean, just talking about it, I kind of feel the flooding. Like I refuse to ever live in that environment again. Again, revealing what is hidden, being willing to let go of control, having these conversations and the willingness to be hurt. Again, the willingness, like it's risky to reveal what is hidden and to let go of control because I might be hurt. But if I'm not willing to be hurt, well, there you go. I'm right back in freeze and appease or conquer and dominate. That's why we call it courageous vulnerability because it requires the willingness to also be hurt, to let go of control. You know, most men see vulnerability as, we see it as weakness, we see it as something that's gonna be used against us, or we see it as a tactic for manipulation or control or coercion or, mm. you know, it can be those things. But I say, when we learn to really come out of the shadows and practice courageous vulnerability, we become actually invincible. I mean, imagine the warrior going into the warrior who refuses to even be willing to be hurt. That man or woman will never go into battle. Yeah, if you refuse the willingness to be hurt. You'll stay on the sidelines forever. You'll stay on the sidelines. If you have to yeah. control everything completely, it's chaos when you're doing whatever your service is potentially. Josh, the word you just mentioned um, earlier was that it feels humiliating to be that vulnerable. There was a humiliate. That was the word for me mm, yeah. with some of my, and I've been married 20 years. There was some really deep stuff that wasn't talked about until yeah. the last couple of years where I actually had needs. And one of them was I needed some praise. Fucking, mm. I needed some praise. I was ashamed. I was ashamed to say that I needed that because men shouldn't have to. 
And if you're doing it right, it should come anyway, but it mm -hmm. wasn't. And so for me to have to go like, oh, actually, I need some more. I was like, ah, oh, fuck, it's so humiliating, you know? But that vulnerability, I'm a scary human. I guess it made me safe enough that there was a big response and we had a uh, massive breakthrough, yeah. but fuck, it was humiliating. Well, that was a hard well, one the, for me. Well, the question that comes up for me immediately is who taught you that praise makes you selfish or the need for praise makes you selfish or the need to be seen or acknowledged either that who taught you that overtly or who just ignored the shit out of you for most of your life. That was really painful. Who didn't see you and thus taught you that my need to be seen doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. I'm only going to get hurt by needing to be seen. And yes, there are those people. And then there's also society. Well, the right? whole world around us, no yeah, doubt. Like men aren't allowed to do that. That's not what men do. A hundred percent. I mean, there's a whole rabbit hole we could go down here. My dad left when I was four years old. Mom was so busy working. Dad was off doing his adventures. You know, who's tending to me? Nobody, okay, so I grew up with rage in my home, but nobody hit me. I wasn't beaten. I wasn't abused in any overt way, but you know what? I was neglected emotionally neglected. Nobody ever comforted me. The shit I was going through, I was being bullied. Cousin committed suicide that I was close to. Again, parents divorcing. I was smaller than most of the kids in my classes because I skipped a grade. I'm just fucking holding on for dear life, but nobody was checking in with me. Mm. So there I learned again, growing up, getting into relationship, not only do I not expect my wife to check in on me, to try to comfort me when she does, it's really uncomfortable. Like, why are you doing this? I don't need anything. I'm fine. <laughs> Meanwhile, I'm dying inside for something I can't even hardly name. The interesting thing that Josh and I both discovered when we started K4, our men's group, we would start with like, what's the gold in your week? What's the shadow? You know, we go around the yeah. circle and this yeah. is before it went big. It was like yeah. we rented a little church. I was shocked that it was almost every single man was saying their shadow was a lack of appreciation. And I always just felt that, but I thought it was like a secret hidden thing that was yeah. unique to me. Mm -hmm. And to hear this almost universal wound as service-based men, mm -hmm. like we serve, but we get compensated for this service. The compensation is we get acknowledged or we get appreciated. Like, mm -hmm. hey, thank you. That was a tough thing. A lot of, a lot of medals in our world too. Yeah. To not be part of a culture or a time or a society that isn't appreciating those acts seems to be well, a core wound for a lot of men these days. No doubt. One of the maps that I like to work with is the masculine and feminine map. And to be clear, when I say masculine, I don't mean man. And when I say feminine, I don't mean women. I believe every human has masculine and feminine capacity. Most men, we tend to identify with masculine values, let's say. I know that there's a lot in what I just said, and I'm going to just leave it at that for now. The masculine identifies itself through doing. If I do good, I am good. The feminine in this map identifies with being. If I be good, I am good. You know, that's why for a lot of women, the biggest fear they, that they can be labeled crazy. You're crazy. And what do we men often do? She's crazy. We go right to that. She's crazy. She's being bizarre. She's being crazy. But what do most men fear? Being a fuck up. Yeah, insignificant. I did it inadequate. wrong. I can't do it. Exactly. Inadequate. I can't get hey, the job why, why done. Why is it crazy for women? Crazy is about being. Who are you being? You are a crazy person. You are crazy. Okay. I got you. You are insane. You. you are out of you. sync. Yeah, see? Okay. okay. You're crazy. You're being. I mean, what? what is the... You know, the thing men are often, you know, heterosexual men are often both drawn to and completely reject is the wild woman with all mm -hmm. kinds of energy and emotions. We're mm -hmm. drawn to it and we reject it at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Josh, how you doing? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> you sweating? Starting to sweat right. a little bit. So we got the core wounds so, of the women of the being or being crazy or something and then the doing to be inadequate or insignificant. That's the well, core wound for men. So. And what happens in particularly in relationships is we tend to few of us, you know, I've been in a lot of relationships in my day. I'm 48. You know, I've seen a few rodeos and very rarely have I been with a woman who consistently praised me for whatever I was doing. More often than not, I was criticized for what I wasn't doing or what I was doing that didn't work for her doing. I mean, the very core a core aspect of my identity. If I do good, I am good. And yet what I'm often faced with in intimacy is I'm not doing it right. I'm not doing it enough. How much time we got? Man, there's so much, so much we can talk about exploring this. It's such a juicy topic. And I find that it, when we start parsing out these subtle differences, a lot of actually oh, healing and openness and possibility becomes available for us because 
I often, I've had to learn this with my wife. I would impose my value of doing, if you do good, you are good onto my wife. I'll give you an example. One day we went for a walk. This a couple years ago. I needed some challenge. You know, I needed some doing, I need something to do that was challenging. And I saw just a parked car a little bit up the way. And I was like, babe, I'll race you to that car. Right. We're about to do competition who can do better than the other. That's essentially what I'm at. What I'm saying. Let's see which one of us do's better than the other. <laughs> she looked at me like I had three heads. She was like, I'm not into that. I just want to be with you. All she wanted to do was be together. She didn't care what we were doing so much as she wanted to be with. But for me, it was like, oh, it was a moment of frustration because I wanted to do something. I wanted to evaluate myself. How fast am I? How well can I do this thing? Again, it's so subtle, but I know couples that break up over this kind of stuff. You know, we're imposing each other, those values on each other that just don't deeply resonate for the other. So can you take so, that? Yeah, so no, note, to, note to self, no racing on dates, <laughs> on our, our weekly date night. Unless she challenges you and then go for it. Hey, we thank you for listening to the Winner Folsom podcast. Just a couple quick notes. First, if you are a man and you're looking for an honorable and inspiring group of men to hold you accountable and challenge you to grow in your relationships, your fitness, your career, your finances, and your life, go to www.k4men.com. And if you are a veteran, first responder, or man or woman who deals with trauma, and you are looking for some resiliency tools and skills for you, your team, or your organization, go to valorresiliency.com. Hope to see you there. Back to the podcast. I'd love to take this and then to go, okay, so I'm seeing this as probably a lot of couples that are listening going, oh man, the guys are going, we're getting our value from what we do in the world, how we achieve, maybe our bodies, our financial future, our peer group, like how do we level up and we get our camaraderie from each other? Like, let's, let's fucking crush. Yeah. Let's yeah. go do in the world yeah. to become yeah. adequate and shore up that inadequacy. If I'm hearing you, if women that are identifying to the feminine are very yeah. different in their nature and they're going, mm -hmm. how do I be? So what can we do to serve each other, make each other feel seen, yeah. but how do we align in that? Cause that gets a little tricky. If, if I'm a man going, I'm going to weaponize my body. I want to weaponize my finances. I want to mm -hmm. weaponize this. I want a partner to come with me. And she's like, mm -hmm. I don't want to go with you. Like, so I guess that's what I'm trying to draw a parallel. Does that mean mm -hmm. we're not a good fit? Does that mean? And Josh, you know, uh, and what if my needs are to do and achieve, which they certainly are? Mm. Well, great. Get them, be in a men's group. Do that with yeah. other men. But that, there, well, there are certain things I can't do with my men's group that I need my wife's participation with. This is the challenge every single long-term relationship will face. So, every single one i, I mean uh, they're, they're, so sorry about the personal therapy session but no like, this, I, like i do have needs yeah and they are based around doing i have some things that i need to do philip i get you come on now i understand but I'm my wife you. doesn't have those she yeah. doesn't have those doing needs so, <laughs> so she has some being needs that and look we're painting in broad strokes here. It's not like women don't have to do things too. I mean, or, and we don't have being, I mean, I know, we're painting Brian, in very broad strokes. We're talking about me now. Come on, we're talking about me now. Okay, I need but to, you specifically, Philip, all okay. right, sit on my couch. Let's okay. just I kick your to. feet up. You know, let's, let's uh, watch my pendulum swing back and forth. <laughs> Every long-term couple, the Gottman Institute, the famous Gottman Institute that researches couples has in laboratory settings for decades now, they will tell you that every relationship has at least two to three essentially irreconcilable differences, gaps hmm. between the partners hmm. that are unresolvable. I mean, they're irreconcilable. You cannot reconcile them. They are challenges you have to live, learn to live with and dance with. Hmm. That is certainly true of my wife and I, and it sounds, Philip, like it may be true of your wife and you as well. And not all couples fit, learn how to navigate those. And not all couples should. I mean, who knows what the hell anyone should do? I think it's a question of what are you really in for? I think this is why w w it's so important. I think, so I'm 48. I didn't really start doing specifically men's work until I was probably 40 years old. I had no idea how much I was missing the camaraderie of men, mm -hmm. of the doer, you know, my fellow doers. I mean, Josh, when we go on our men's retreats, we do shit. We kind of hang out in a, in a big house and we just enjoy each other's company. But man, like this last trip we did, we, what did we do? We went snowboarding and skiing. We went snowmobiling. 
we, we did shit, man. And my wife, that would have driven her crazy. There would have been too much doing for her. But that's why she didn't come. I mean, that's not only why. It's my men's group. She knows she's not allowed to come to my men's groups. But <laughs> but getting that doing, you know, having the people that I can just go full on adventure with is essential. My wife just, you, when we travel, we went to Iceland back in August. I want to use every single day. We were there for seven days. I'm like, every day I am doing something epic. For my wife, two out of seven days, she'll do something epic with me. And even then it has to be measured. She just wants to be with me. She wants to hang out and be. Yeah, we'll do some fun things. And we definitely did some epic things together, but it drives her nuts when I over-program our doing. But, you know, so we've learned, I just go do those things by myself. And you know what? Sometimes it's a little heartbreaking because I mm. want her there with me. You know, there was this moment I did a, a six mile hike to a, a river, a geothermally heated river. It kind of killed me a little bit that my wife wasn't there with me. But you know what? That's the sacrifice I make for the health of our relationship. Because had I done whatever I needed to do to get her to go, man, it wouldn't have gone well. She wouldn't have enjoyed it. It would have, you know, she, it's just one of the things we have to learn to live with and not beat each other up over. You know, if, if she's making me feel guilty for, for wanting to go on that hike and I'm making her feel guilty for not coming with me, it ruins the whole vacation. I've always had this reaction to when I hear couples say that they, they married their best friend which implies that they're getting all their needs met from this one person. This is the central thing. Like just from an anthropology background, I, I just, it flies contrary to every culture that has yeah. ever existed. Mm. That men, like, like you said, men need men. They actually spend most of their time with other men and women spend most of their time with the yeah. women. And there's a partnership that definitely happens, but it's not the all inclusive soulmate everything yeah. from each other i think it's a setup i think our culture has set us up i'm with you man i, I call it the ideal of the the two-person village the two-person village me and my wife living alone in our own little village and i'm supposed to get all of my needs met there and i'm with you it's a fallacy we are set up because that is a recipe for failure i think now i think you should be friends with your wife your partner you know uh, I forget who coined this term, a uh, passionate friendship. My best friend, I'm not sure about that, but a passionate friend, absolutely. I mean, if I'm not friends with my wife, oh, dude, that's going to be a disaster. Hey, so I'm seeing these, I love these different concepts. One, I'm hearing you say, men are doers, women are being. And there's another one you talk about that I think would also be helpful just to understand some of this is you're saying freedom and connection is another big one. Men are searching for more freedom. Can I be free? Women are wanting connection and there's a little bit at odds. Can you talk about that as well? Because I think it also helps understand yeah. a lot of the challenges happen. Man, I'll give you a good example. It happened today, in fact. That's really kind of heartbreaking, but it, but it reveals this, this difference. The feminine, if you're a woman or man more identified with, with feminine energy, you're, you're, a question that you're living inside of is, what does this mean for our connection? What does this mean for our connection? Whatever, whatever's happening there versus if you're more masculine identified a question you live in is what does this mean for my freedom you know why do i want to you know rock you know jack up my body turn it into a weapon and crush my career and make money and just just dominate my life well because it, i believe in doing so i'll feel more free really in the bottom line of it it's the ultimate freedom that i'm searching for just today i have a year-long coaching program for men it's only only 10 guys there was a, a man who who was all in and my partner who does the enrollment calls came back to me this morning and said, well, he's a no and he's heartbroken. And I thought, well, why? And he said, well, he gave me three reasons and they're actually the reasons that his wife has for him. And reason number one is his wife is afraid that if he does this, this program with us, his confidence will go up and he will leave the relationship. Oh, like that hurts my heart. I mean, you guys, I know you guys feel me on that. I mean, yeah. but, but listen, but listen, here inside of that is her fear of losing connection. She'd rather have a man that doesn't leave her than a man who is really lit up in his being. I mean, we, we all know where that's going. That's not going anywhere good. This is, th th this highlights the difference. I mean, he's seeking, the real tragedy is like one of his reasons for wanting to join this program is so that he can have a better relationship with his wife. 
He can feel more free, more strong, more, more, com more confident, right? But his wife is seeing that as a threat to their connection. And I think this plays out constantly. I mean, my wife and I, same thing, man, over seven years. I remember at the very beginning of our relationship, I would throw out all these scenarios. Be like, okay, so, uh, okay, so you have this sensitivity. So what if, you know, all these what if scenarios, <laughs> you know, testing, like what if I'm just making something up here? So like, what if, what if I want to go to a, a, uh, a nudist resort? You know, I'm not trying to be sexual with anybody, but I want to go to a nudist resort. Like those, those would freak her the fuck out. She's like, why are you doing this? Well, I was testing for how free do I get to be in this relationship? But all she was hearing is this guy is fucking with our connection. He just doesn't want to be that connected to me, but that's not true at all. I was testing for freedom because I know when I see what, what a more masculine oriented person, they, we feel more connected af when we feel free. And, and the opposite though tends to happen for a more feminine oriented person when they feel connected, ah, then they feel more free. So is that essentially, and Philip, you're- Make a note, you're, you're muted. Philip, make notes. <laughs> I wasn't saying anything, I was just taking notes. Make notes, man, that was a good one. Yeah. When you oh, yeah. feel, or ladies, when your men feel more free, they will be more connected. And, and is that essentially the goal of, of all this is understanding that in each other? So as you're a man, you're framing your level of freedom of how it's going to bring you more connected to your partner. And the same thing with learning to express that need underneath in how you communicate things. So you're not disconnecting. You're actually wanting to connect deeper, deeper levels of intimacy by having a little bit of freedom to get there. It's there's nuances. Nothing is so black and white. I mean, cause I've worked with, I've worked with couples where the man is saying, look, if you just let me have sex with other women, I will never leave you. And she's over there thinking, is this guy fucking crazy? He wants to, he thinks that him having sex with other women is going to make me feel more connected. Fuck off. Like I've, I've worked with those couples that are stuck in that conversation. The magic happens when, again, we're taking a very, you know, heterosexual binary conversation of, okay, man is more masculine oriented and woman is more feminine oriented. It's not always the case. I mean, especially in the first responder community I've worked with as an air force officer, I worked with women that, that probably would have identified way more masculine than feminine. So that's why I want to just hold that caveat out there. I want to make space for, for the women who, who may not identify exactly how we're lining this up. So just want to you know, make that clear. But when that more masculine identified partner realizes, okay, my partner is interpreting everything through the filter of what does this mean for our connection? Well, now I can be more sensitive, more thoughtful, more attuned to, okay, like, how do I explore this? Like, I have a need. I have a need to feel free in a certain way how can I explore that need? How can I language my questions or my curiosities or my needs in a way that doesn't trigger her connection fear and vice versa? See a lot of what happens to a lot of women, I certainly experienced this is when they fear losing connection, they start to get very controlling and demanding, which what does that do? But fucks with his freedom. Right. So the controlling, demanding, you need to do this, you need to show up, you need to whatever that those are the women I chose. And I mean, look, some women just shut down and say nothing. That polarity exists there, too, which that doesn't go well, because then that guy just gets bored and he's like he can either walk all over her and or do whatever he wants. And there's no accountability. Anyway, it doesn't go well. But when she can learn to voice her needs for connection in a way that doesn't present as an overt threat to his freedom. Now we're, we're having great conversations. Now we're, now we're really talking in a way that we're on, we're on, it's like we're on each other's side. You know, I, I'm not threatening her connection and she's not fucking with my freedom, but we're partnered in how do we both get our needs met? Yeah. I love this. And I, I just want to, I was going to say it like I have, I have a copy of your book, uh, which I highly recommend. It's gotten beat up pretty bad because I've traveled with it a lot. But as we start to wind down, like I'm sure this has drawn a lot of insight and anybody listening is going, oh, I want to learn more. How can people get a hold of you? I highly recommend you get his book. Really good book. How else can people either follow you, learn more about you, any programs yeah. you have coming up? Like just how can people learn more about you or get in contact with you to go a little deeper? Yeah. Choose her every day or leave her. That's the name of the book. It's on, you know, anywhere you get your books, choose her every day or leave her. I'm on Instagram, 
Facebook. I'm not embarrassed to say I'm also on TikTok, though you won't find me dancing there. Uh, just fill up. Maybe I'll get you on there. We'll dance. That'll be yeah. that'd be fun. I'll be your background. Um, <laughs> My website, there was one, really one stop shopping for everything, brianreeves.com. It's Brian with a Y. Thank you for pointing that out at the beginning, Josh. Brianreeves.com. You know, what, what I'm doing is I love to do, you know, high contact coaching programs with men. I'm really focusing on men. I do work with some couples still, but y- you guys know that we men, we need support. You know, what, 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 what you men are doing as well to bring men into community is so invaluable. I'm doing similar and with my own flavor and my own focus, you know, I'm, I have a year long coaching program for a small coaching program for 10 men. Uh, I have a relationship focused program for men. And those are really the, the two big offerings that I have right now. And you can find those on my website, brianreeves.com. Thanks for asking Josh. Yeah. And Hey, uh, just to, we always end with a challenge. If anybody that's listening, what's the challenge they can work on and implement something from, from listening today, you got a challenge for everybody. So I would say, I'll give a few challenges. If you're in relationship, reflect on whether you tend to stand more for freedom or connection with your partner. And if you notice, and you might notice by, by listening to what your partner tends to argue more for, you know, you might hear it more in what your partner is, is agitating for or, or speaking for. And it's, it may very well be connection. It's likely going to be connection for most of our listeners that our partner is wanting. So ask them, ask them this question. What could we do that might help you feel more connected to me every day? Now, they may not even be able to answer that right away, or they might even give you an answer that causes you terror. <laughs> like, oh my God, what have I done? <laughs> what have I opened myself up to? The thing that I want you to know is that, you know, five minutes of real connection every day will go so far versus what what most relationships go with what I call the, the the crisis of of connection where they don't connect for months or years or ever so just ask that question what could I do or what could we do that would help you feel more connected every day right ask that question if you're not in a relationship I'd still invite that inquiry do you are you more you know I I, I call it you know my, my wife is um I'm the freedom fighter for our relationship. She's the feelings fighter. You know, she's fighting for our feelings because she feels connected when we when we feel together. But again, I'd, I'd invite the single person too to just reflect on what do you tend to stand for in relationship? Is it more connection or more freedom? Sometimes it's both. We all need both. Yeah, we'll just reflect on that because you're going to be in relationship again someday. And if if your value is freedom and you try to impose that on the next person you're with, well, it's probably not going to go too well. Learn from that. Learn from your past. Is that a good enough challenge? I mean, the first one's pretty specific. That's it's great. Perfect. Solid. Okay, good. I, I'm, I'm uh, conducting your challenge today. <laughs> How so? Immediate so action. Us. Yeah. I'm implementing great. it today. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, Get in the truck with my wife. We're, we're going to, you know, I mean, I'll be asking the question. I personally would love to hear how that goes, Philip. Yeah, dude. It was a just a brilliant episode. I took lots of notes, lots of actionable things. Uh, really cool to connect with you, man. Thank you. Likewise, Philip. Appreciate you. Appreciate yeah. you both. Yeah, thanks so much for coming on, Brian. Such a such a pleasure and value packed with information for anybody that listens. So thanks so much for joining us and everybody else. Stay battle tested.